All right. So I want to welcome everyone to our chemistry seminar today. Again, a um, very special seminar, very cool topic and relevant topic. Today, one of my students, uh, Haley Mellish, I think I'm cor correctly pronouncing her name. Yes. <laughs> we introducing our speaker. She's an undergraduate here at Andrews uh, University, uh, pursuing her bachelor's in dietetics. She has already has a bachelor's in linguistics. So that's a pretty interesting change um, from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And she also has an associate's in film and television production. She is versatile. Um, that associates was from Tribeca Flashpoint Academy in Chicago. And she says, after five exhausting, crazy years of working in television, she is now exploring her love of food and a desire to promote health through dietetics. She hopes to work in uh, medical nutrition therapy after becoming a registered dietitian, and she will be a good one. Thank you. Jim. Haley, the time is yours to introduce our speaker. All right, thank you for introducing That was a great introduction. Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I will continue the chain of introduction. Um, <laughs> Our guest today is Dr. Jason McClellan. He is the Welch Chair in Chemistry and Professor of Molecular Biosciences at the University of Texas at Austin. He researches viral proteins and his work to understand how these proteins are structured and how they function has factored into the development of vaccines and potential treatments for deadly viruses impacting billions. He is one of the inventors of a way to engineer a key protein in coronaviruses for use in vaccines. The technology his team developed can be found in many leading vaccines against COVID-19, uh, such as Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson, and Novavax. McClellan and his colleagues also designed key proteins that form the basis of several vaccines now in clinical trials against the coronavirus, as well as separate proteins used in vaccines against respiratory syncytial virus, RSV, a virus especially dangerous for young children and seniors. He is the winner of multiple scientific awards, including the National Academy of Sciences Award in Molecular Biology, the Welsh Foundation Norman Hackerman Award in Chemistry, and many others. His research and expertise have been featured in multiple media outlets, including CNN USA Today, New York Times, Washington Post, and National Geographic. Dr. McClellan earned a BS in chemistry with an emphasis in biochem from Wayne State University and his PhD from the John Hopkins University School of Medicine. He conducted his postdoc research at the National Institute of Health Vaccines Research Center. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Jason McClellan. All right. Thank you, Haley. That was, that was excellent. Thank you, Desmond, for the, for the invitation uh, to, to come speak. So yeah, I grew up in Michigan, uh, St. Clair Shores, right outside Detroit, went to Wayne State, met my wife there. All of our family's still in Michigan, so we're always coming back. Uh, always happy to talk to people, talk to people in Michigan. So let me let me share my screen, my presentation. All right, so I thought I'd talk about structure-based vaccine antigen design and its application to respiratory syncytial virus and uh, coronaviruses. I, I am obligated uh, to mention that I have conflicts of interest because I'm an inventor on patents related to these uh, stabilized coronavirus spikes and RSVF proteins and their use as vaccine antigens. And I'm also an inventor on patents related to coronavirus neutralizing antibodies. All right, so I think this is a, a nice uh, summary from a, a review by Reno Rapawoli, um, former uh, head at GlaxoSmithKline about the structure-based vaccine antigen design. Now, a lot of the original uh, older vaccines were very uh, empirically developed without much understanding of the pathogen and particularly without much or any understanding of the, the proteins and their three-dimensional atomic structures. And so you'd sort of just isolate the pathogen um, and then either inactivate it or weaken it in some way inject it and sort of hope it elicited a protective immune response. With structure-based vaccine design, sort of going opposite, we often start with 
uh, people who are uh, infected and who survived, and they survived in part because they made um, antibodies from B cells that protected them against the pathogen. And there's been a lot of progress in antibody isolation, characterization, B cell sorting. And so we can now sort millions and millions of B cells from somebody who survived something like RSV or Ebola or coronavirus. And then uh, these can be individually sorted into wells. Uh, the antibodies that these B cells produce can be uh, expressed, tested for function, right? So we can screen them for neutralization, which is really the ability of the antibody to bind to a pathogen and prevent entry. We can also look at different properties, like those that bind with very high affinity, um, those that maybe have substantial breadth and that they recognize diverse strains or isolates of the pathogen. So we may have originally hundreds or thousands of antibodies and we're able to down select to a subset, five, 10, that are really like the best antibodies humans can produce against this pathogen. Uh, and then my lab and others were involved in the structural characterization, trying to identify uh, with high resolution where these antibodies engage the, the, the virus uh, or the viral protein understand that three-dimensional interaction, and then leverage that information into the design of vaccine antigens. And so maybe this antibody, the, the FAB, uh, will bind this red part of the antigen and not the, the purple part. So then we, we can use uh, computational grafting and maybe display just the red part on a self-assembling nanoparticle and inject that to try to re-elicit very specifically these best in class antibodies. So it's a very rational engineering type approach. It's iterative. Um, we, can, we can draw blood from the people immunized in the phase one, characterize those antibodies, see if we're making the right ones, and if not, tweak the, the antigen uh, further. All right, so a lot of the proteins that my lab works on are class one viral fusion proteins. Uh, these are really important vaccine antigens. So, uh, many of the viruses are envelopes, so they have a, a lipid bilayer derived from the host. And to infect the cell, they have to fuse the viral membrane with the host cell membrane. And to do this, many viruses use these fusion proteins. There's class one, class two, and class three fusion proteins. Um, we study primarily class ones. Class ones include the coronavirus spike, the HIV-1 envelope, influenza hemagglutinin, and then the F proteins for or fusion proteins from paramyxoviruses and pneumoviruses. Uh, so of these, the coronavirus spike is by far the largest, uh, with, and then the, the F proteins are generally the smallest. They are related to a common ancestor, some original fusogen. Um, and that's, that's best seen uh, if we do this type of alignment. So these molecules are synthesized as an inactive precursor that needs a protease, a host protease, to cleave and activate it. So we can align them via this cleavage, uh, which is obligatory. And so you can start to see the better alignment. So this portion of the molecule, that's the fusion machinery. That is what is related to some ancestral fusogen. There's four elements in the fusion machinery that, that are needed for activity. There is the transmembrane domain, which anchors the protein and the viral membrane. There is a fusion peptide, and that's a, a, a stretch of hydrophobic amino acids that will eventually harpoon into the target cell membrane. And then there are heptad repeats, these repeats of seven amino acids that will interact with each other, kind of bends in half. Um, these two portions come together, they form a coiled coil. These molecules are trimeric, so you get a trimer of coiled coils, which end up forming a, a stable six helix bundle in the post-fusion state. Uh, so that's the fusion machinery, and then many of them have fusion suppressive caps. So sort of if this is the stalk of a mushroom, then like the S1 subunit is the cap on the mushroom that maybe is uh, involved with receptor binding and regulation, so that way the triggering and confirmational rearrangement of the fusion machinery only occurs at the proper time and place. So we started working on RSV 
and the RSVF protein. That's sort of unique that it doesn't really have a fusion suppressive cap and how it's, how it's triggering, triggering is regulated is, is still not well understood. Um, you know, we know it exists. All these proteins fold into something called a metastable prefusion state. Um, so, you know, some, most proteins have a single state that they fold into generally the, the most stable thermodynamically these proteins initially fold into a state that's not the most stable thermodynamically, but they're kinetically trapped. Uh, so they're kind of, yeah, they're kind of unstable. Um, so it folds into this prefusion state. There's some trigger uh, that causes a conformational rearrangement where the fusion peptides shoot into the host cell membrane, forming a pre hairpin intermediate. This then begins to kind of jackknife in half as the coiled coils walk toward each other. And then eventually it adopts a post-fusion conformation that fuses the host cell membrane with the viral membrane, forming a fusion pore and allowing the genome uh, and contents of the virus to enter the cell and then infect the cell. So well, there's been a lot of work um, trying to develop interventions based on this. So there's antibodies in small molecules that can bind to the pre-fusion state and prevent the conversion to the post-fusion state. And if you do that, then you block, you block fusion, you block entry. Uh, and so then they're also, you know, these pre-fusion molecules are also really ideal vaccine antigens because they will elicit these antibodies that can bind the pre-fusion state and prevent the conformational change from occurring. Um, the main problem, as I mentioned, is that the prefusion conformation is metastable. Uh, so it, it is tricky to purify, it's tricky to study because it, it just wants to spontaneously adopt the lower energy post-fusion conformation. Uh, so we, I did work on this back as a postdoctoral fellow in Peter Kwong's lab and working with Barney Graham at the Vaccine Research Center. I was able to determine the structure of the post-fusion form of the RSVF protein back in 2011 is when we published it. And then in, in 2013, I was able to get a crystal structure of the pre-fusion form of F um, and was able to do that by binding it to an antibody, um, which is not shown here, but the antibody binds at the apex and locks it in the pre-fusion state, prevents it from refolding. Uh, so that gave us now um, high resolution structures of pre and post-fusion. Uh, so you can see these are trimers. One of the protomers is shown as a ribbon. The other two are shown in gray and white. Um, there's no fusion suppressive cap that sits on top of the fusion machinery. The hydrophobic fusion peptide in red uh, is found inside the center of the protein, sort of sequestered away from the solvent. If we look at a single protomer, just like to compare the two ribbon diagrams, then you can see that about half of the protein shown in white does not undergo a conformational change. So you know, this, uh, this helix, turn helix is in the same conformation, most of this beta sheet. It's really the N terminus and C terminus of the F1 subunit that undergoes a really substantial conformational change between these two states. Uh, we can see that the C terminus in magenta here, this pivots around this point and flips 180 degrees to form the outer helix of the six helix bundle. And then the end terminus of F1 undergoes a complete rearrangement and refolding. So you have a hydrophobic fusion peptide, a helix, turn helix, a beta hairpin in yellow and green, and then the alpha four helix in blue. And all of that flips around and forms one long continuous alpha helix in the post fusion state. So even secondary structure that initially folds into a beta hairpin ends up refolding into the alpha helix. Uh, so really incredible, uh, these little protein uh, machines that can undergo these changes. And so what we wanted to do then with the structural information is design amino acid substitutions that would allow us to express and purify the prefusion F locked in that conformation without having to use the antibody that we originally used to get the crystal structure. Uh, and so it, I was able to do that. I designed several substitutions. Uh, one was a introduction of a disulfide bond. So there ended up being two serines that hydrogen bond uh, through their side chains, through the hydroxyls. And one serine is in a region in blue that moves between pre and post. One was in a region in gray that doesn't move. And so replacing those serines to cysteine, which is really just an oxygen changing to a sulfur, 
forms this covalent staple that can lock the protein in the prefusion state. And then we also added in some cavity filling substitutions. Um, these proteins, of course, they have to be unstable. Um, so there's a little pockets and cavities that help uh, provide instability. And so we were able to fill them. So we could change a small amino acid like serine to a phenylalanine uh, that filled the pocket. It makes it unfavorable to pull that phenylalanine uh, out of the pocket. Uh, and so with these substitutions, we could express and purify this molecule uh, that we call DSCAV1 for disulfide and cavity filling. Uh, then uh, Barney's lab immunize mice first and then rhesus macaque. And uh, so this is a, a prime boost four weeks apart. And what we saw is that if we immunize with the post-fusion form of the F protein, we do get neutralizing antibody titers. Um, but they're generally in the hundreds. But if we immunize with the prefusion F protein, then we get neutralizing antibodies in the thousands and uh, approaching 10,000. So about a 50-fold increase in neutralizing antibody titer when immunizing with the, the prefusion F protein. Um, and so that work was really exciting. It was published um, two science papers in 2013. Uh, there's a news and views about structural biology triumph offers a hope against childhood killer. It was a top 10 uh, breakthrough of the year in Science Magazine. We were one of the runners up. Uh, some vaccine design looks do matter, kind of showing the, these antibody epitopes that are in completely different conformations between pre and post fusion. Uh, and so that, that pre fusion F molecule has actually been working its way through clinical trials, just going at the more leisurely pl place that a lot of vaccine development goes, about a decade or so. Um, we did some additional work with Johnson & Johnson and, and their division called Janssen and my colleague Hans Langedijk. They actually created an alternative method of stabilization, uh, which I really liked. Uh, and so it's in this region. So between the central helix in green, that doesn't change, and this first helix in blue that has to flip 180 degrees, uh, Hans put a proline substitution. So mutated a serine to a proline that really, that one substitution really locked uh, the molecule in the prefusion state, substantially boosted expression. Uh, you can see, so that they actually tested a variant that contained each amino acid at position 215. And so we're looking at expression on this side. And so introdu introduction of the proline uh, gave a really big boost in expression. Um, and then we can also look at the stability, the fraction that retained the prefusion confirmation. And even at day 18, we're still almost 100% of the protein retained the prefusion confirmation. So sort of remember that uh, for our later work on coronaviruses, this proline substitution in the hinge region. So as I mentioned, these prefusion F-based uh, RSV vaccines have been making their way through clinical trials. They started the phase one in 2017. That looked good. They're safe. In 2020, sort of the summer, uh, summer of 2020, they started the phase three trials. It was kind of lost a little bit among all the, the COVID-19 vaccine development. Uh, and then just last year, June and August, the readouts from these pivotal phase three studies were announced by GSK and Pfizer, uh, and they both showed uh, really efficacious vaccines, vaccine efficacies, um, 82 to 86%. And just yesterday and the day before, uh, FDA advisory panel uh, voted to recommend both of these RSV vaccines for older adults. So they now have to get final approval, which could take a few months. Um, but it's pretty cool to see, see this molecule and this pre-F protein I uh, helped create as a postdoc finally make its way all the way through and, and looks like it'll be the first RSV vaccines to be approved uh, since the virus was isolated back in 1956. So in 2013, when we published this work, I was leaving the Vaccine Research Center to start my own laboratory at, at Dartmouth and Barney and I wanted to keep working together. And we we're sort of wondering, well, what, what other pathogens, viruses, can we apply these structure-based vaccine design principles to? And you know, 2013 was right around when the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus had emerged in Saudi Arabia and the surrounding area uh, and caused a really lethal infection. About 35% you know, of people infected with MERS died. And fortunately, it doesn't spread easily person to person. But since we had the SARS epidemic in 2002 
Then we had MERS in 2012 and 2013. It seemed like we might be on a 10-year clock and that there could be another coronavirus emergence and then 10 years later, 2022. So we thought we should really start working on coronaviruses, figure out structures of their spike proteins, how to stabilize them and make the best possible vaccine antigen. And that's what we set out to do. So I think a lot of people probably know um, a lot more about coronaviruses now than they, they, they did pre-pandemic. But uh, just to show you that these are, it's a very large family of enveloped positive strand RNA viruses. There are four genera, the alpha, beta, gamma, and delta uh, coronaviruses. There are four coronaviruses that um, circulate annually and are a cause of the common cold. Uh, those are 229E and NL63, so two of the alpha coronaviruses, and then two lineage A beta coronaviruses, HKU1 and OC43. So generally mild respiratory uh, infections, although they can be severe in certain people. And then some, some of these other uh, lineage B, lineage C beta coronaviruses that have, I don't know, that we're most worried about. Uh, so you have MERS, coronavirus here, and then SARS and, and SARS-2. So the surface of coronavirus is decorated with spike proteins, and that's been appreciated since the, the 1960s. That was when the two first human coronaviruses were isolated. Uh, these are showing some nice electron micrographs of these coronavirus, and, and they could see that they have these uh, club-like protrusions uh, and so this group of scientists wrote a letter to Nature in 1968, where they put forth the name uh, coronavirus. They, they noted that the particles are more or less rounded in profile, although there's some polymorphism, polymorphism uh, and that they have this characteristic fringe that recalls the solar corona. Uh, so they said, well, we should call these uh, coronaviruses, and the name has, has stuck. Our plan when we started working on this in 2013 was to obtain the first structures of coronavirus spike proteins in the prefusion state, design stabilizing substitutions, and then test those as vaccine antigens. Um, even as of late as 2016, when this review was published, you know, we, we still didn't know what the prefusion spikes looked like. There were structures of individual domains. Uh, so some nice crystal structures, of the S1 subunits N-terminal domain, the C-terminal domain of S1, which is often referred to as the receptor binding domain. Uh, that was shown to have a, a consistent beta sheet, and then variable loops emanating out. All of these bind uh, peptidases as their receptor, although the peptidase activity isn't required. Uh, it's still, still a mystery why they all these viruses use peptidases as the receptor. And then the fusion machinery, uh, we didn't know what that looked like in the pre-fusion state. There was only some crystal structures of the post-fusion helical bundles. Uh, so we tried to start working with the MERS coronavirus spike. That, that was a very unstable, very difficult spike protein to work with. We could express and purify just the N-terminal domain of S1 or uh, the entire S1 subunit. But if we tried to do the full spike, S1 and S2, we basically couldn't make anything. There's just no band. Uh, fortunately, Brownie's lab was also working on HK1, which is one of those seasonal coronaviruses, and that spike protein behaved really well. Um, and so these are some uh, negative stain EM images from Andrew Ward's lab. Uh, we could make S1, S2 with uh, the cleavage site accessible, so you could get the two subunits, or we could mutate the cleavage site. We could add a trimerization motif. Uh, but all these proteins behaved really well. So we sent them to Andrew's lab at the Scripps Research Institute, and his lab was able to obtain a four angstrom cryo-EM structure of the HKUNS protein in the prefusion confirmation. You can see the S1 subunit is in blue, S2 is in pink, the other two protomers are in gray and white. Uh, it revealed that the N-terminal domains are located on, on the periphery, and that the receptor binding domains are what mediate the trimerization of the S1 subunit. And so S1 has this really interesting kind of intercalated uh, architecture where it starts up here, comes down and back up, kind of goes underneath a neighboring receptor binding domain. The structure also revealed 
two uh, smaller domains called subdomains one and two. And then most importantly, gave us a look at what the spring-loaded free fusion confirmation of the S2 subunit looked like, where the fusion peptide was located. Uh, so this is a really nice structure, explained a lot, of, you know, decades of biology and biochemistry about coronavirus spike proteins. Uh, so since that time, uh, Andrew's lab has determined more structures. My own lab has determined many structures. David Beesler's out there. And so we actually have a really nice um, molecular model for how the coronavirus spike proteins function. So I'll sort of show a little video. So there's spike. Oops, what happened? There's spike. And we have the S1 subunit here, the S2, like the stalk. We know that now that the receptor binding domains hinge open and expose themselves to the receptors, upon receptor binding, you get dissociation of S1. Then the fusion peptide in cyan shoots into the host cell membrane, forming the pre hairpin intermediate. This then begins to collapse as the coiled coils walk along each other, forming the highly stable six helix bundle, sort of zippers up, brings the viral membrane and host cell membrane together. Now you have a fusion pore, the contents of the virus enter the cell and, and the cell is now infected. So what we wanted to do was to create stabilizing substitutions uh, that could allow us to express purified pre-fusion spike to use as a vaccine antigen. And we could leverage the fact that there's a lot of similarity between the S2 subunit of spike and the RSVF protein. Uh, so I hear that the coloring is similar, particularly it's the end terminal part that we're interested in. Uh, where you have the central helix in blue that doesn't undergo much conformational change. And coronavirus spike has that as well, as well these long central helices. Um, and then this first element that flips around and polymerizes the, the helix, we also have that in the coronavirus spike. And so we tried a number of things, uh, but what ended up working was the introduction of proline based on our work with uh, Hans on, on RSV. And so my postdoc, Nian Shuang Wang, uh, tried scanning along this region between the central helix that doesn't move and the first helix of the heptag repeat one that has to flip around and form a continuous alpha helix. Um, and so this region is highly conserved in beta coronaviruses. So we're showing the different lineage, HK1, MERS, SARS-1. They all have RLD, two non-conserved amino acids, and then a conserved glutamate. Uh, so Nian Chong started putting prolines in these positions. And what he saw was that just the introduction of single prolines in this hinge substantially boosted protein expression. And that's something that we need to look for. Generally, as we stabilize class one viral fusion proteins, we see an increase in protein expression. So you can see uh, wild type, we could make just a little bit of a very faint band, but a single proline substitution gave us a nice boost. Uh, and then the one we liked a lot was a double proline substitution at these two positions to cap this helix. So we were able to get about a 50-fold boost in protein expression just by introducing two prolines in this region. Uh, when we looked at that by size exclusion chromatography, we could see that the two proline spikes in blue are really well behaved. Again, we get so much more protein uh, compared to the wild type spikes in red. Uh, when we sent these proteins to Andrew Ward's lab for negative stainium, they showed that the MERS spike, the wild type MERS spike was a heterogeneous mixture of post-fusion spikes in red and pre-fusion spikes in blue. But the two proline form of the spike was all in the pre-fusion conformation. Uh, so then we sent these proteins to Barney's lab uh, and Kazmekia Corbett, a postdoc in Barney's lab, who I think has spoken to you before. Uh, and so Kizzy immunized mice at a low dose, 0 0.1 microgram per dose, with either the two proline stabilized spike, wild type spike, or just S1 subunit. And what we could see by looking at neutralizing antibody titers to these different variants of MERS is that immunization with the two proline spike gave about a five to 10 fold increase in neutralizing antibody titers compared to wild type or S1, indicating this is really an optimal antigen for coronavirus vaccine development. And what we're excited about is that this region is so conserved among beta coronaviruses, just based on a simple sequence alignment, we would know exactly where to put the two prolines and any of the other beta coronaviruses. So 
uh, we looked at SARS, the one from 2002. Wild type in red, we could make a little bit, but with the prolines in the same position, a really big boost in protein expression. Wild type SARS was a mixture of post-fusion and pre-fusion spikes. SARS of two proline was all pre-fusion. Uh, again, even HK1, where the wild type protein expressed and behaved well and was sufficient for our first structural studies, the two proline spike gave a big boost. Uh, we looked at OC43. We even cloned a spike from a bat coronavirus um, that has, still has not emerged in humans. Uh, and the two prolines really worked well there. So sort of a universal method of stabilizing coronavirus spikes based on these proline substitutions. And we had all of this published uh, and patented back in 2017. All right, so we were well prepared. Uh, at this point, I had moved from Dartmouth to the University of Texas at Austin, and uh, we continue working on coronavirus spikes and spike structures. Uh, so we were prepared when um, it was identified that the causative agent of these uh, pneumonia clusters of unknown cause in Wuhan uh, was identified as a novel beta coronavirus. It was actually very similar to SARS, about 70% sequence identity in the spike protein. Uh, so we had to wait until January 10th when Chinese researchers posted the genome sequence of SARS-CoV-2 online. Uh, within 10 days, my postdoc Nian Chuang had cloned eight different plasmids expressing different stabilized forms of the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. Uh, he was here till like 4 a.m. every night. 10 days later, uh, my grad student, Daniel Rapp, had purified the spike proteins and started cryoEM data collection uh, that night. And about 12 days later, we had determined the structure of the stabilized SARS-CoV-2 spike protein and submitted the manuscripts to Science and BioArchive. So we went from a novel viral genome sequence being released online to a submitted manuscript describing the spike structure in one month. Um, so that was exciting, and we're never going to do that again. Uh, but but it was it was good to do it once. Uh, our our SARS-CoV-2 ectodomain structure with the double proline, uh, we put it corresponds to amino acids at positions nine eight six and nine eight seven. Uh, here's one of our early gels. I don't think we even published this, but just showing you know compared to wild type spike, uh, the substitutions at nine eight six and nine eight seven really give a nice boost in protein expression. And we were, we were able to get about a mg per liter, did not express as well as MERS or SARS, but sufficient for our structural studies. And so uh, we determined the structure by cryoelectron microscopy. Uh, it revealed that at least in our particle stack that all of the spikes had one receptor binding domain shown in green in the up conformation where a combined receptor and then the other two RBDs in white and gray here were in the down conformation. Uh, that was accepted within two days after submission with no revision. And so that, that's never going to happen again. But again, it was good to do once. Uh, we were trending on Reddit. It was pretty cool to open up my phone and see our spike structure trending. The paper has been cited over 8,000 times now. Uh, so it's like all down here, uh, downhill from here. Uh, but cool, cool that it's been well, well received. What we are most excited about, of course, uh, is that all four COVID-19 vaccines authorized for use in the United States use our prefusion stabilized spike protein. So Moderna's mRNA-1273 contains the two P mutations at positions 986 and 987. Pfizer and BioNTech's community also has the 986-987 proline. Uh, Johnson & Johnson, which used an AD26-based vaccine, uh, they, they tested uh, six or seven different spike protein variants, some with the proline, some without, uh, and they tested that in non-human primates. And based on that, they chose the double proline form of the spike protein, which worked best. And so that's what they used. And then even Novavax, uh, which is the more of the purified subunit-based uh, vaccine antigen, theirs also contains the 2P mutation. So again, really cool to see something we started a long time ago in the lab, end up making it into these highly uh, efficacious vaccines. But we thought we could do better. We weren't happy with the low protein expression of, of only a mg per liter. We had sent the plasmid to make the two proline spike to about 100 labs around the world. And people were having a hard time making it because of the low yields. It wasn't as stable um, as, as our MERS and SARS variants. And so Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation reached out to see if we had like a something more stable, a second gen form, and and we didn't, but 
uh, we thought it'd be interesting to try and do a, a second iteration of structure-based vaccine design now that we had determined the chromium structure. Uh, and so my postdoc and I, Ching Lin She, designed 100 individual amino acid substitutions in the spike protein uh, to try to further boost expression and stability. Those could be roughly grouped into four different classes of substitutions. That includes the introduction of additional prolines, like if two are good, maybe four more are better. Uh, introduction of substitutions to form salt bridges. So a threonine uh, substituted to an, a negatively charged aspartate that could then form a salt bridge with a nearby positively charged arginine. Uh, some cavity filling substitutions, mutating small amino acids to larger ones, and then the introduction of disulfide bonds. And so uh, Ching Lin and my grad student, Jory Goldsmith, uh, led this effort because after the design, we had to clone, express, and purify 100 different spikes. And so we also worked with my colleagues, Ilya Finkelstein and Jennifer Maynard. Uh, they had grad students and postdocs who also contributed to this effort. Uh, so we expressed 100 different variants. And here I'm showing uh, maybe the top 25 or so, just looking at protein expression. So uh, our base construct, uh, our comparator is the two proline form of spike. All these are individual substitutions, or in the case of disulfide bonds, double substitution introduced on top of the two prolines. And so you could see that um, some of these substitutions boosted expression five, six fold. This is a glycine to a glutamate that would form a salt bridge that gave us about a six fold boost. Uh, several of the prolines gave us three fold boost. A942P gave us a seven fold boost. We had two disulfide bonds that looked promising uh, and several uh, cavity filling substitutions. Uh, so we now had to combine them. Um, and we kind of sort of had a goal of increasing expression about tenfold and creating a more stable molecule. And we did that just by doing combinations of prolines. So the two proline spike uh, shown here, combos 14 and 45 had four prolines. Combo 47 had six total prolines. Uh, that one gave a really nice boost in expression, about nine to 10 fold based on size exclusion chromatography. So if you look at area under the curve, uh, the S2P, again, didn't express particularly well, but combo 47, uh, I, think, I think it was about a nine fold increase in protein expression. Uh, based on the melting temperature, uh, we were able to shift the melting temperature by about five degrees Celsius by negative stain EM, it was just a homogeneous field of prefusion spikes. Since I had six prolines uh, in combo 47, isn't a very sexy name, uh, we changed it to hexapro for some labeling purposes. Uh, hexapro looked great in large scale. We could scale up and make about 11 mg per liter in freestyle cells. In XP Cho cells, we were getting 32 mg per liter. And again, a substantial increase of uh, hexapro over the two proline. Uh, you know, Daniel Rapp determined a uh, cryo-EM structure just to make sure that the introduced prolines, the four additional prolines, didn't alter the conformation of the S2 subunit, and it did not. Hexapro is in green, 2P is in white, uh, and the, uh, all of S2 just superimposes. Uh, this time, instead of shipping the plasmid to so many people, we deposited it at Agene, and they ship it. And so they've now shipped it to over 205 labs uh, around the world. So it's really, uh, Hexapro has really been being used a lot by researchers for diagnostic assays, vaccine development, probes for antibody isolation, um, and also a lot of structural studies. It's a very stable molecule to use uh, for structures. Uh, so we tested this. We wanted to see if 6P was an intrinsically better immunogen than 2P. So we sent the protein again to Barney's lab uh, in Olu and Kizzy, immunized mice uh, three weeks apart with a terminal bleed three weeks later, uh, tested three different doses, 0.4, 2, and 10 micrograms. Uh, here we're looking at the neutralization titers that were elicited. Uh, what we can see is that Hexapro always elicits a higher neutralizing antibody titer than 2P at each of the doses tested and it's most noticeable at the lowest dose. So at the 0 0.4 microgram dose, uh, you can see we kind of get a, a modest immune response from the two proline spike, uh, but Hexapro gives a really robust response. And there's very little difference, um, very little dose dependency, 10 microgram, two microgram, and 0.4 microgram. So I think Hexapro is a really outstanding 
second generation vaccine antigen for COVID-19 vaccines. Um, it has been and has continued to be incorporated into different vaccines that are being developed. Um, I was going to share two examples. This is one we really like. This is a platform based on Newcastle disease virus. Uh, this is an avian paramyxovirus, generally uh, infects birds, does not cause disease in humans. And uh, Peter Polisi and his colleagues at Mount Sinai inserted our hexapro spike into the genome of this virus between the phosphoprotein and the matrix protein. So you create this recombinant virus. And the big advantage is that this can be grown in chicken eggs, uh, which is how a lot of the world produces their annual influenza virus vaccines. And so after inoculating the eggs with this recombinant virus, it just grows to really high titer uh, an NDV virion that's just covered in hexapro spikes. And then this can be chemically inactivated and used to immunize people. And we think that this has a real benefit for low and middle income countries. Uh, so we've been working with Thailand, Vietnam, Brazil, and Mexico have been developing these. And Thailand has been really quite far along. They have a very sophisticated vaccine manufacturing plant uh, that, that uses chicken eggs, all robotically controlled. There's a nice YouTube video if you want to check that out. Uh, and they can make about 20 to 30 million doses per year themselves. And so they call it HXP for Hexapro, uh, GPOVAC. And so th there's the vials. And uh, the human trial data look really good. We're listing a really robust neutralizing antibody response that's about tenfold higher than the antibody titers seen in people who've been infected with COVID-19. And it's just entered phase three in Thailand in December of last year. Uh, so we think this is really cool that these countries can make, make their own vaccine. They don't have to wait or, or pay exorbitant prices for the mRNA-based vaccine. So I think this could be really helpful for vaccine equity. And this is another, this is another example. This is a collaboration with an Australian company called Vaxis. And so they've created a delivery system that doesn't require needles. And it just uses a, these um, patches that have a microarray of small projections that can be coated with your antigen or antigen plus adjuvant. And so you can see pre-delivery, uh, they're sort of coated in, in a darker gray. And then post-delivery, you can see the amount of the antigen, the vaccine that's been deposited in the skin. So from the, the tip down to these white arrows. Uh, and so yeah, it, it, they created this little applicator. It looks like a little mini tuna can that's spring-loaded. You press it onto your uh, shoulder, push the button, and it just provides a, a spring. And, and it gives you 5,000 little mini micro projections. Um, and it's thought to help increase uh, uptake of dendritic cells. And the preclinical results look really good. Uh, they entered a phase one clinical study. And so we're, we're waiting for the results, but I think that's really exciting. What's cool about this is that um, the vaccine Hexapro on these uh, little patches are stable at room temperature for months. And so you, you can imagine being able to ship sleeves of these little applicators to low and middle income countries places where cold chain storage uh, is a problem. They don't have access to freezers or refrigerators, and you don't even need skilled healthcare workers to deal with the syringes. You, you could actually even just self-apply these. Uh, so we think this could be, a, again, a really nice development for next generation COVID vaccines. Um, let's see, I think a, a few minutes, I'll just briefly talk about our work on pan-coronavirus vaccines, You know, sometimes referred to as the dream vaccine, a single vaccine, that could maybe protect against all variants of SARS-CoV-2, possibly something that protects against all SARS-like coronaviruses, which are called sarvicoviruses, uh, and then maybe even a vaccine that could protect against SARS and MERS, or, or all beta coronaviruses, so a pan-beta. Uh, there are a lot of ways to potentially do this, although it's all very difficult given the diversity uh, of the spike proteins. And there, there's a lot of approaches generating self-assembling uh, nanoparticles, displaying RBDs from different spikes. If we look at the sequence conservation of a spike protein, you can see that the N-terminal domain, the RBD, pretty much all of S1 is highly variable. 
but S2 is, is very conserved. And so we've been focusing on the S2 subunit, trying to use it as an immunogen, essentially taking the cap off of S1, trying to create these stabilized S2 subunits and raise antibodies that could maybe bind very broadly. Uh, the S2 subunit is highly decorated in N-linked glycans though, which uh, are non-immunogenic because they're, they're self-antigens. And so that is, that is one issue, but um, we have been able to engineer S stabilized S2 only proteins that lack the S1 subunit and they do fairly well in animal challenge studies. And so we, we ship these proteins to Ralph Barrick's lab at UNC, uh, Sarah Leist in his lab, immunize mice, and then challenge them with either mouse-adapted SARS-CoV-2 or mouse-adapted SARS-CoV. Uh, you can see that uh, Hexapro itself, as well as the stabilized uh, stock version in orange, uh, completely protect against SARS-CoV-2 challenge. And they actually provide partial protection against SARS-CoV challenge. So SARS from 2002, uh, which we think is really exciting. These S2 only antigens have been really useful for characterizing uh, novel antibodies uh, that my colleagues have identified against the S2 subunit. So this is one of them. Uh, this is another one, it's a really interesting antibody uh, from Evelyn Georgiev's lab. It binds straight down the apex uh, of the S2 subunit. And every amino acid the antibody contacts is highly conserved among all the different cervicovirus spike proteins. So this single antibody actually binds to SARS-2, SARS, MERS, uh, HK1, really fascinating antibody. Right. So uh, hopefully what I've been able to show you is that you know, our earlier work on pre-fusion RSV subunit vaccines have achieved now greater than 85% efficacy in phase three trials and have been voted for approval by the FDA advisory boards yesterday and the day before. Uh, prior research on COVID spike structures allowed for the structure-based design of two stabilizing proline substitutions. Uh, these substitutions are found in all four authorized for in the US, but then uh, additional ones throughout the world, uh, including one in Taiwan from Metagen. Hexapro, which contains four additional prolines, substantially improved and has entered phase three clinical trials as part of the NDV platform. Again, we're continuing to do some work on universal coronavirus vaccines um, and particularly identifying novel epitopes, particularly in S2, that can be targeted by really broadly reactive neutralizing antibodies. Uh, this work is incredibly collaborative. Um, I've highlighted a lot of people in my lab listed here. Uh, Barney, who I've been working with since 2009, Andrew's lab for a lot of the, the early work on the HK1 spike and then later the MERS spike structure. Jennifer, Ilya, Greg for the work on um, Hexapro, and also Jimmy Galahar and Evelyn Georgiev uh, for the isolation of the antibodies. Uh, funding is shown here. Thanks very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. All right, thank you. All right, thank you so much. Welcome. Um, at this time, yeah, we will invite any questions that people have. Okay. Don't be shy, I'm happy to answer anything. So I could get things started with some basic uh, chemistry. Uh, so I'm assuming a lot of the binding that you're talking about is just your regular protein, non-covalent, hydrogen bonding, salt bridges, nothing yeah. really exotic, right? For the stabilization, like the different yeah. engineering approaches? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, because we're limited you know, we're limited to the amino acids present. We don't want to do any like chemical treatments, chemical cross-linking, just protein engineering. And we've been learning more. It's been really exciting, of course, the last couple of years with machine learning and AlphaFold. And so we're starting to use some new machine learning approaches to identify additional stabilizing substitutions that maybe by eye, uh, we sort of miss. Um, and that's that's been true. We, the machine learning have, have come up with some really interesting substitutions that maybe still don't understand how they work. Um, so it's, okay. so it's a cool time. Okay, good, good. Okay. Anybody else has questions? I don't want to take up all the questions. Novak, do you have questions? He's our biochemist. In the meantime, again, I uh -huh, go ahead. Yeah, I do actually have a question or two. 
Um, uh, there was um, there was a slide in which you talked about. Uh, I think it was the dose versus the titer or the yeah. dose, and you said there was not that it, 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 there there wasn't a strong dose titer relationship yeah. or whatever. Um, oh, yeah, just in the sense that for Hexapro, we we weren't seeing a substantial decrease in neutralizing antibody titers uh, as the dose got lower. Okay. Well, you know, one of the more interesting uh, effect, uh, one of the fundamentals of, of of cause and effect is that there is a, you know, the, the dose and the response, there ought to be some sort of uh, relationship between the yeah. two. How do you, how would you expand explain oh. the fact that there's not that sort of dose relationship? Perhaps that doesn't work with biological materials, but I oh, mean, no, 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 there absolutely would be. We're just out of range. We're out of the, the dynamic range to see it. Um, oh, I see. So okay. in particular, I mean, presumably in humans, but often in animals, um, you can just saturate the immune response possible, right? So if you right. give them 10 micrograms or five microgram, uh, you just can't make any more antibody, it seems. And so for Hexapro, it seems to be so potent that even at 0.4 micrograms, we're still near the plateau of what's possible. Um, so we okay. might have to dose down to 0.04 and even lower, but but there 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 certainly would be eventually uh, once we get in the right range to see it. Yeah. What 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 biochemically do you attribute adding these prolines? Yeah. Why do adding these prolines yeah. cause such a strong immune response? What's your theory behind that? That's my question too. Yeah. So it's a great question. It's, it's not just the pro. I mean, uh, let's see. The prolines are stabilizing. Uh, yeah, some of them in that hinge region that has to refold, uh, that really increases the activation area, activation energy to prevent the refolding from occurring, uh, in part due to the restricted phi psi angle uh, that Rama, that prolines have in Ramachandran space. Some mm -hmm. of the other prolines are, and actually some of those too, are even, uh, they tend to cap helices, right? So uh, the beginning of a helix you have an unpaired amide hydrogen on those amino acids because there's no carbonyl to pair with it. Proline mm -hmm. doesn't have that unpaired, doesn't have an amide hydrogen. Um, right. and so putting it there really helps stabilize. So prolines are often found capping helices. Uh, and then, so why does it lead to a, a more potent immune response? That's something that's complicated because it's a little bit of a black box uh, upon injection. What we know happens is that and when you inject an antigen like that, it doesn't just sit there. It gets taken up by dendritic cells. It goes into germinal centers. There's been some recent work suggesting that um, there's a lot of metalloproteases surrounding the germinal center. And so on the way in, if your antigen's getting chewed up and degraded, you're going to have less antigen. But if you can survive that, if you have something stable and robust to the proteases, uh, then you get more antigen in the germinal centers and perhaps elicit more antibodies that way. Uh, so that, that's a recent, I think, science paper where they were, they were sort of looking at this, that inside mm -hmm. the heart of the germinal center is relatively devoid of the metalloproteases, but all around it. Um, and so we're wondering now, should we be using metalloprotease sensitivity as one of our readouts for antigen design? Okay. Hmm. I have one more question. And this... I, it may not be relevant to this work. And so if it is, please just tell me and that's fine. Mm -hmm. But in my Biochem 2 class, we just have briefly touched on the role and purpose of the major histocompatibility complex mm -hmm. yeah. in, in that. Is there a relationship between that? I mean, I, it, yeah. make it as about as simple as you can, but yeah. doing the major histocompatibility uh, uh, complex and the immune response dealing with your particular um, protein and your method. Yeah. Uh, in the sense that, you know, you do need T cells to generate B cells. Uh, you, you need T cell help. Um, we don't really do anything to engineer the T cell um, response. I mean, that's, that's primarily just the linear nine amino acid uh, peptides. You know, we do try to change as few amino acids as possible because we don't want to destroy potentially good T cell right. epitopes. Um, so that's that's a, that's about it as far as it goes, as far as like we think about uh, the T cell T cell epitopes. Okay, yeah. that was a consideration early. Uh, yeah. Even Pfizer and BioNTech, they were considering maybe doing mRNA just encoding the small receptor binding domain versus mm -hmm. the whole spike. And one yeah. of the reasons they ended up going for full spike, in addition to just having more epitopes, uh, mm -hmm. just there'd be a lot more T cell epitopes. Um, sorry. Okay. 
it'd be more antibody epitopes, but also more T cell epitopes in a 1200 amino acid spike versus a 300 amino acid RBD. Exactly. Yeah. I have one more question, but I want to ask it last. <laughs> cool. uh, so it, it, just before everybody goes, because it may okay. not be answerable by you. So okay. all right. I have one more question. So in addition to the proline, proline effect, yeah. what other amino acid are showing, you know, either comparable or, you know, slightly? Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, some of the uh, charge substitutions where we, we make a substitution that is now able to form a salt bridge, uh, oh. those can give really substantial boosts in expression. I mean, that, that's several kcal per mole potentially, potentially um, mm -hmm. and, and can really boost expression. For it didn't work particularly well for spikes. For some of our work on paramyxoviruses, some disulfide bonds are uh, tremendous. I mean, we made one for human, we made a stabilized antigen for human metanumovirus that contains four additional disulfide bonds. Uh, we shifted the melting temperature by about 18 degrees. Like uh, the, the thing is just a rock. And so that's actually being, that's been licensed now and is being developed. So uh, sometimes disulfide bonds work well. Sometimes we think maybe, there's too many cysteines, uh, you can get mispairing as the protein's trying to fold. And, and so sometimes they're actually, mm -hmm. you can take uh, a hit in expression introducing a uh, disulfide bond. So yeah, we like those. Cavity filling, we can find these little pockets of instability, try to mutate serines, alanines to leucines, phenylalanines. Um, those are some of the, some of the approaches. Okay. So have, uh, this is kind of like a little bit out there maybe, but have people tried to substitute on natural amino acids uh, this to see maybe an unnatural cyclic yeah acid like proline to It'd be interesting um I think so <laughs> not I mean probably maybe in peptides or smaller immunogens where you'd be able yeah. to synthesize that yeah I can't like yeah I can't think of an example I mean that's something, that's something we probably would try to avoid just, uh, and at least currently, in the current climate where there's so much exuberance, at least in the <laughs> pharmaceutical industry for mRNA, yeah. um, you, know, you wouldn't be able to encode that. Yeah. You wouldn't be able to make that. Um, and so a lot of the things we're thinking about now are you know, making sure it's compatible with being encoded as mRNA. Mm -hmm. So I'm not a biochemist, and so, when you use the term uh, neutralizing, oh yeah, like mean really? Yeah, that's a yeah. It's more of a, like a immunological term. Um, essentially, it's really it's really an in vitro uh, effect where you mix virus plus antibody for some amount of time, add that to cells, and see if the antibody has reduced the fraction of cells that are infected by the virus. Okay. And you do a dose risk. So you dilute down the antibody and you measure infectivity as a dilution series. And so we sort of take an IC50, which is the concentration of the antibody that blocks 50% of the infection. Okay. And so some, some antibodies are, you can go down to picomolar concentrations of antibody. Um, some, it, it's usually related to affinity, of course, and how, how tightly it binds. But yeah. So at least for coronaviruses, the best correlates of protection are really the, the titers of neutralizing antibodies. And, and that's what after vaccination, after infection, people are always interested to, to like draw blood, figure out what your neutralizing antibody titers are. Once they drop below a certain threshold, you're much more likely to get reinfected uh, again. Okay. Yeah. Um, another basic sort of question for protein, work, um, structural work for proteins, viruses, is it mostly crystallography? Is it? Depends. I, so I was trained as a crystallographer. I did 10 year, my grad school and postdoc was all x-ray crystallography. Okay. Now my, my lab, we do about 90% cryo EM uh, and, and about 10% x-ray. Cryo EM. Yeah, cryo electron microscopy. Uh, okay. Yeah, and so that was a big change in around 2013. Um, cryo EM used to be considered blobology. Uh, it would generate these very 10, 15 angstrom blobs, volumes. Um, and then you would have to dock in crystal structures. 
they introduced a new type of detector based on uh, CMOS technology in 2013. It led to new algorithms. Uh, and now you can get like 1.2 angstrom structures by cryo-EM. You don't have to crystallize the protein. It's okay. really convenient. Uh, the major, limit, major limitation is the quality of the protein sample and uh, size is still an issue. You need to be larger than about 100 kilodaltons in order to get enough contrast with the, the frozen ice. Yeah, I remember like some biochemists and uh, inorganic chemists back in Wayne State um, took taking pains to like form the crystals in order to get, you know. It's rough. It, it's tough. Yeah. It's tough work. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of witchcraft and black magic involved. Uh, yeah. We actually use like, we use cat whiskers horse tail, uh, all yeah. these things to try to like get the crystals to form. Oh. Yeah. And then they don't, and then they don't diffract maybe. And so cryo we just freeze grids and, and you're looking at individual molecules like that okay. night. It's really, it's really okay. fantastic. Yeah, Students like People's uh, PhD degrees were hinging on. Oh know. yeah. Whether that thing crystallized or not. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. So yeah, just a general comment that's kind of fascinating to me is that you and guys in your field seem to like have these proteins as like playgrounds. You know exactly all the different points yeah. and the amino acid, this number. And it is incredible to me that sort of, you know, information that yeah, that's yeah. Great. I mean, we stared at it enough. I mean, especially, I mean, on those, like, you know, back then we were building it. Uh, yeah. you, you get the density, but then you actually have to build amino acid by amino acid. So yeah. you end up almost memorizing where every amino acid yeah. is. And somebody says position 350. I know right where that is in yeah. RSV. That is, yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> All right. Should we, let, should we let David ask his question? Let, let David ask his question to take us out. <laughs> um, Oh, Does sorry, remember a telemarketer. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, I do. Okay. Actually, hold on, hold on, hold on. I mean, this is crazy. All right. So um, you may not be able to answer this question uh, just out of sheer political uh, uh, wisdom, but do you have an opinion about the origin of this uh, oh. virus? Um, yeah, of course. yeah, I have an opinion, right? Nobody, nobody <laughs> knows. Um, right. As far as I'm concerned, it's, it's a uh, natural origin, right? This is the okay. seventh uh, coronavirus to spill over into the human population. So there seems to be no, there seems to be no uh, conflict that the first six were all spillover events from animal reservoirs. So I think that's mm -hmm. the most likely explanation uh, for mm -hmm. SARS-CoV-2. Uh, there's no evidence it's engineered. I think there could be a low probability that the virus did at least pass through a lab, right? So uh, something that evolved in nature was in an animal, perhaps researchers going into caves to sequence um, ended up bringing back and studying SARS-CoV-2 uh, and having it escape. Um, so that's, to me, that's very different, like the lab leak hypothesis versus the uh, bioengineered weapon, right? And so I think- right. I don't think there's going to be ever any way to act like we're just never going to know. Um, right. But there's no evidence of engineering. We're actually terrible at engineering. Like we wouldn't even know how to engineer it to make it. Uh, and you know, I think eventually they're going to find a virus in some animal reservoir in China that's 99.98% identical. They they haven't they haven't found one yet they haven't found the they haven't i mean they get close you get closer and closer i mean you're just because of all the changes like you're rarely going to find i mean even for for sars they ended up finding one that was very the original and the palm civet um uh, mers is from camels you eventually get close but it's a lot of animals uh to to try this sequence and study so that's my take on it um, i think regardless since we will since we'll never know whether it came from pass through a lab uh you should just you know review all procedures uh, evaluate risks for types of right. research etc right. just assume it right. did uh right. and adjust protocols accordingly mm -hmm. sure you, Wait. One, question, yeah. one quick question do you have opportunities for undergrads to do research during the summer with you potentially i have four undergrads in my lab now uh ut students uh 
Yeah, we have had visiting summer mm -hmm. students. Okay. Um, it just kind of depends a little bit like how much I'm traveling and I don't want to have somebody have a bad experience, but um, yeah, certainly if people reach out and we, okay. we can think about that. All right. So we want to thank you so very much. Very good. Uh -oh. It's into something that's actually real life yeah. relevance. Thank, thank you, you so much for your time. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks here. for all the great questions. Yeah. David Desmond, nice meeting you. Haley, thanks for the great introduction. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Right. Don't be afraid to reach out. Take care. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.